um, of course, tragedy arose, but it also died. And how did it die? Through Socrates. Socrates, he stands for science and uh, trying to find the answer to everything. And that's against this kind of aesthetic way of finding the meaning to life, which we get from tragedy. And there's always be a limit to science, says Nietzsche. It won't answer the existential question. He has an answer, a famous sentence which goes something like, um, only through the aesthetic can life be saved. What does he mean? He thinks a bit like children who are on the beach playing with sandcastles. They build a sandcastle, the waves come in, it's washed away. They build a new one, again and again. This desire to create, again and again and again. Like the artist who paints a picture, if they could paint the perfect picture, they would never paint another one. But Nietzsche says, we keep on painting, if we're a painter. Keep on creating. And it's this aesthetic expression which is so important. And it's almost like an answer for Nietzsche's own personal answer to why we exist. It's this desire to create, to move on, and not just to find the scientific answer or believe we found the answer to everything. If we move along, and Nietzsche's interested in aesthetics, how does he then move along and talk about truth? Because surely there's a paradox here. This is the person who criticizes uh, Socrates and modern society's belief in science. Well, he moves along by saying in the preface to Beyond Good and Evil, what if truth was a woman? What? Surely that's an absurd statement. And this is Nietzsche who's known for his kind of hatred of, of women who want to uh, move beyond their biological purpose in life of having children. He's, you know, and, well, in, in this case he's a little bit more relaxed and he says women, they've learnt to to cultivate the, the superficial, the surface of things. And what if, what if, he says, truth is not that which lies behind? We're all so accustomed to looking and saying to people, well, what's the truth behind something, behind an assertion or a, a phenomenon? And he says, no, no, maybe the truth is in the surface. And this is what women have understood. So in this sense, he's paying women a compliment, although not all women would want that compliment in quite that form. And he moves along to, say that this is the point. Truth may well be something that is in the, the surface. It's not something we can find in a single thing that is a total answer. It's not the truth which we found for all eternity. It's not like religion is the truth of everything or science is the truth of everything. It's rather the case we must say not what is the truth but how do we make truth, under what conditions, in whose interests. And this can vary. For priests, it's one kind of truth. For a businessman, it's another kind of truth. For a scientist, it's another kind of truth. For an educationalist, another again. And this is his point. He in, embarks on a project which he never completes, is investigating different kinds of truth and how they're made. We can have truth about morality. The list is endless, but not any one of these forms of truth is allowed to dominate and have the total monopoly on what should be truth. And if we follow this idea, in his book, The Genealogy of Morals, he looks at morality. And we get a practical demonstration of what he means. You can have this, this idea of the Greeks who were concerned with finding the beautiful or the good, as if they found it forever, and that is their de definition. And, and we have people today who will still define things in those kind of terms, that this is the beautiful, or this is good. Nietzsche, he says, well, let's do a genealogy, he says. Let's look at the conditions behind them. And what he f focuses on in this book, in the genealogy of morals, is the, the story between, be behind good and evil, or good and bad. And he says, the rulers, they tend to focus on good and bad, saying they are the good, and the bad, that's everybody else. And the, the slaves, or the people who are under them, they have a different morality. That's the morality of good and evil. The slave says, I'm the good. You master, or you ruler, you are the evil. There's a difference here between good and bad, good and evil. One of my colleagues and I, we have developed our own kind of idea of a Nietzsche-inspired educational project where we focus on what Nietzsche calls resentment. 
resentment isn't quite the, the word in English. Nietzsche gives it its own special meaning, so it's probably just as well to call it resentment. And what he means is that the slaves, they cultivate resentment. Whenever somebody uh, hurts or insults or offends them, and it's, how do we overcome this? Well, the ruler, if they're offended, Nietzsche says, they fight back spontaneously. They react. And then they're done with it. It's forgotten. But the slave, if they're offended, they cultivate resentment. They look for ways of revenge. And Nietzsche's point is that it's an emotional action. You may never actually achieve this project of revenge to fruition, but you use your life's energy, and that's quite a destructive way of using your life's energy. So what we're thinking, well, maybe this idea kind of applies to kids, you know. Maybe they are offended or feel that the teacher is offending them in some way, could be harassing them. Maybe other pupils are bullying or there, there are conflicts between kids. And we've said that, well, this is maybe cases of how sh should kids react, that they should actually learn to react in different ways. Maybe some occasions a spontaneous reaction is a good way of solving things. On other occasions, it's not. Maybe you should just think, well, what is a better way of doing it? Maybe we're actually saying they should embark on their own projects of resentment. Not a good idea. But it's important that kids develop a repertoire. And that's really our point. When we talk about a, uh, a project of uh, an education of resentment or towards that, we don't mean that everybody should go around cultivating it. But kids should develop the ability to recognize it and also to cope with it, either when they're doing it and realizing that they're doing it or resisting it. Another concept that uh, I've been interested in in some of my research is, is Nietzsche's idea of nihilism. Nihilism, we're accustomed to think, is you feel nihilistic, you give up, you've got no interest in things, you sit on the sofa and you can't be bothered to even get up and make a cup of coffee. Nietzsche has this idea, but he also has what he calls positive nihilism. That's where you actually break down something that, that's existing to make room for something else. And that according to Nietzsche, is quite a healthy form of nihilism. We find it in youths who are moving from being youths to being adults. There are certain things, certain relationships, certain ways of understanding that have to be broken down to make room for new ways of understanding things. Norwegians have this tradition. Third-year stu students in high school, they are what they call rus. They dress up in red overalls or blue overalls, depending on the subject, or black overalls or even white overalls, in May. And from the 1st of May until National Day, on the 17th of May, they party, they drive around in old American cars or vans, which are painted and decorated, they drink a lot. And uh, they do different kinds of dares. It's kind of things like um, running across a, a bridge in a city naked in the middle of the night. You know, you, you get a little knot on your little cap for that. Or you sleep on a roundabout all night, you get another little knot on your special little cap. And uh, how can you interpret this? You know, coming from a different culture, I come to Norway and think this has got to be mad. You know, I mean, this is two year, two weeks before their final exams, which decide what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. You know, going on to university or to college or something else, and yet they're willing to party. And I was thinking, you know, well, maybe Nietzsche's got a point. Maybe what they're doing here is it's a form of this uh, nihilism. They're breaking down all the accepted boundaries that school society, adult society has, and they're doing something totally different. They're breaking the norms. A planned normlessness, you might call it, because they planned it a whole year. And they might also be experiencing a tiredness with school. It's after 13 years of schooling, many are ready to give up. And this period of partying, this period of, of almost Dionysus uh, celebration of a god of wine, in a way, it's giving them a chance to relax. And the strange thing is, come the end of the national day, they put away their overalls, they sit down and they all study. You ask them, did it actually affect their, their ability to do well in their studies and things, or their exams? And a big amount, or a fairly large number of them will say, no, it didn't. This way of celebrating gave them a chance to relax, to recharge their batteries. And I think this is what we get from Nietzsche. It's a different way of looking at things. He kind of turns things, what we're accustomed to thinking of as scientific, truthful, the truth, 
And he says, well, wait a minute. Let's have a different set of questions, a different form of morality. Let's cultivate the aesthetic look on things as a way of kind of putting the scientific way into relief for a moment. And the same applies to this idea of morality, different forms of morality. From Nietzsche, I think you can learn this shifting of perspectives, looking for different meanings, and not always looking for the meaning that is hidden, focusing on what is actually there. Good luck in your readings and discussions of Nietzsche.